I'm kind of sad that we feel like we still have to. Many of my compatriots who are asked to speak about these topics, we find ways very quickly to jump off of, so what's it like to be a woman fill in the blank, to talking about the people and the causes and the traditions that really are what got us into this in the first place. The first for me is the recognition that I and we stand on the shoulders of giants. Right? Many of the doors that have been opened to me in my personal and professional life, whether it was as a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford or in rabbinical school, or being able to marry a female partner, all of those are battles that others fought. And I came in on in the generation when many of those doors were open. But speaking from my own experience, the one thing that we are not lacking as progressive religious folks is we are not lacking things to do. We are not sitting around twiddling our thumbs waiting for people to come in. In my very first year here, Quebec began questioning its relationship to new immigrants and remember all that talk about reasonable accommodation. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we never want to hear that again, but it's still here. That, that debate is still here. Uh, and let's face it, most of the talk was really focused on Islamophobia with Jews and Sikhs thrown into the mix. Veiled what Muslim women became the central target, and arguments were made about feminism, which in practice really called for taking away the right of one group of women to express themselves as they chose. When I first spoke about the right for Muslim women to choose to veil themselves, some people in my own congregation were shocked. They could not believe that I would say something like that. And we have come a long way since then. And I was so proud of my community when they went through a democratic process. And during the difficult days of the proposed Quebec Charter, Secular Charter, we created and hung a banner outside the church with many religious symbols of the words, Vivre ensemble, live in harmony. And that's before the mayor's office decided to use that thing. That was a while ago. But it was a major thing to do to actually put that banner outside to actually say, this is where we stand in this very heated debate in this city and in this Yeah, place. so one of the reasons I think that I became an activist is because um, I was born an indigenous woman. I had, well, I was a baby first, but I, I had a, a native mother. And I think that, that really means something in Canada. She was born in a little cottage or a little cabin in Fort Chipewyan. And her mother was also born in this community. And my grandmother's mother, so four generations of women were born there. And when I think of my mom, she's not that old. She's just, you know, like in her 70s. But her first method of transportation was actually a dog sled. We live in a very racist society, and we still do. So what I learned growing up was you kind of live underground. So you, um, you know, you fit in and you get a, get along, um, but you, all, you almost um, naturally become an activist because you know that something isn't right, and so you do what you can to try to address it without drawing too much attention to yourself. So when I look back, one of the, my early, uh, I guess, activist movements was when I was in school, I would always uh, kind of stick up for the kids that were getting picked on or targeted. And only thinking back as an adult later, I realized those were all Aboriginal kids. They were never labeled as that, but they were the dark-skinned ones, and they were the ones that were in foster care and didn't have any parents, and were just kind of moved through the system, and they didn't really have very many friends. I'll just share one other thing, too, because on this journey, I went and tried lots of things. You know, in the Indigenous teachings, and when you're working with young people, the most important thing is to help them find their purpose. And we do that through helping them feel connected to, to people they love, care for, their community, their earth, nature, whatever it is that gives them the sense that they really belong here. This planet is for everyone. We all have the right to belong. We're a lot. We're women who can't get a divorce. And so became and began my passion, my activism. We also knew women needed help right now. And when you're faced with a woman who needs help right now, you do whatever you can right now. You work on the long-term law right now. And we knew that the Canadian government, the 
Quebec government was easier move than the rabbis. <laughs> and let me paraphrase that more carefully, the orthodox rabbis. With Lisa, I could have worked right away. <laughs> we did incredibly, within five years, get a bill in this wonderful government of Canada of ours at 21.1, a bill which helps other note through the civil divorce process, e e even out the playing field. It doesn't get it get immediately, but it helps them in a wonderful series of ways, better than anything in the States, better than anything in Israel. We've managed to accomplish a lot. So by 1990, we had civil legislation in incredible ways. My life has been enriched by the people I've been able to work with. I stand in front of you, 2017, a grandmother of 12 wonderful grandchildren. Hearing all these remarkable stories of incredible women, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not that surprised, because I wouldn't be where I was if I had not heard remarkable stories by incredible women, which encouraged me to be where I am. But I do think it deserves recognition. And I think that it's incredible that you all came here today, particularly in today's climate, where you're not supposed to talk to people who don't look and sound like you, um, to actually hear this. And, and I hope to also share some of your own experiences. So thank you for that, and thank you for everybody who organized this. My parents immigrated here from Libya in the early 1980s. Um, my father is a general surgeon. And they are incredibly religious parents, very acultural. Um, my family is, is a proud family of mixed marriages and mixed ideas, but they were religious, and, and their religion taught me, I remember one of my mom's favorite quotes was that God's mercy is greater than his anger. That was always what she would say to me whenever I did anything wrong. And I did everything wrong. I mean, I was a middle child of 11. I had excuses. Ask any psychologist. I mean, it was, it was acceptable. So. That was what I grew up in, that was the environment where I was taught that God was loving and giving and merciful and, you know, in my own family, and I think many immigrant families can identify with this, or children of immigrant parents, you hope that your daily actions and your daily work is worthy of your parents' sacrifice. Faith permeates every single space, and our, and our, and our expectations of women, our, our definition of women's roles, and, and the fact that we often ascribe them only to caregivers and mothers, and they can work in the social services, and the most important thing is whether or not she's reproduced. Those, those variables are often you know, underlied heavily by the way we've traditionally seen women, and the way we've traditionally seen women has been the way we've interpreted faith to see women. And it always confused me, because you know, when I was growing up, I had, I had my own different difficulties understanding the way in which faith was practiced on a community level in Saskatoon, where I was born. I would always wonder, you know, why are women entering from the other door? Why is the prayer hall for women getting smaller? And my dad would say, don't see what people say about God, because people see God in their image. And God determined that the first convert to Islam would be a woman. And it was a woman who financed the Islamic faith. It was a woman who protected the Prophet in war, who fought in militaries. It was women who took care of the Hadiths, the saying of the Prophet. It was put in their safekeeping. The Quran, the holiest book in Islam, was kept in the safekeeping of a woman. It was women on every level, economic, social, political, and military, dominated the very foundation of faith. Before human interpretation and influence could really permeate, it was women, which means that was God's work. God's work was that women go in side by side in war, and they come out side by side as leaders. And then men got involved. Don't get me started. <laughs> okay, so that was the interpretation that I always took on. And that's what we see around the world today. So in my daily work, I don't lead a congregation, although I think I should lead many, but we'll talk. Um, I don't lead a congregation. I don't lead a faith group. I I, I do my daily work in global security and global health. Um, so it's, it seems very distant for many people from faith. But my faith uh, impacts the way I operate in the world to an incredible degree. It allows for me to say that every single person needs to be part and parcel and partners at tables of decision making. Be it if they are women, men, regardless of sexuality, race, gender, etc. That's what I've learned from my faith. 
and, and faith is so far separated from our daily reality because a lot of it doesn't mesh anymore because a lot of our religious institutions are old men who don't realize that you got to reinterpret and you got to re-embrace and you got to accept that people don't look the way you want them to look and think the way you want them to think, but they can still believe in a very humble, kind, loving and merciful God. The question is, how do you propose that we as women make a change when no matter how much progress we make, we are not recognized by our own peers, especially women? <laughs> that, what a great question. Uh, I mean, that's a hard one. And I know I have faced it myself when I worked in the corporate world. That's sometimes the hardest people to work with were other women because they had made it to the top and they didn't want to see other women take their unique place. So I think it's that we have to see it as um, this is a shared responsibility and we just have to keep working together and looking within ourselves, where is it that we're, you know, we want to have a leg up over everybody else and where do we need to turn around and offer space to someone else to also shine? I have no idea. <laughs> comes down to recognizing that it's not necessarily the fault of um, other women. This is internalized misogyny. It's it's the way that they were raised. It's They were raised to believe that, I mean, and I'll give a good example. Um, during the Libyan Revolution, my, I actually uh, started working predominantly on sexual violence and conflict, and I remember sitting down with a young woman who had been violated, and, and she said, listen, I don't need you. You look like me. You can get what I can get. I need, like, I need a guy, and this is in a, in a pretty kind of conservative community. And so we have to recognize that the, the assumptions of our abilities are not limited only to men. Not only men think that women are incapable or, or, or less capable than they are, et cetera, et cetera. That permeates, right? That's a societal construction, and we have to begin to dismantle that by doing the work anyways. So within my own community, I know a lot of people think I should stop talking. Um, <laughs> Because I don't, because I am, no, 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 it's true, but because I'm not what a Muslim woman should look like to them. And to the external community, I'm told to stop talking, because I'm not what their expectation of a Muslim woman is. And oftentimes, in both of those spaces, the, the hardest hit comes from other women. And it's because they are upholding traditions and societies and structures that they have been told they can fit into and that that's the only way they can succeed. So when you're talking about things like gender norms and gender constructions, we have to realize this is not a, you know, put a law on it and it'll change overnight, or, you know, build a shelter and everybody will come. No, these are, these are societal and cultural challenges that will take generations because you're asking people to unlearn everything they believe in. And you're telling women the way they raised their daughters was not right and the, ways they, the, the way their mother raised them was not right. It's a long-term thing where the only thing we can really do is slowly open that door and hopefully turn the lights on and leave them on for whoever else wants to enter. But it'll take time. 